Well, hello. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone back. We have a special guest with us today whose resume would take an hour to get through. Uh, this is Bob McDonald. I'm, I've been invited to call him Bob, so this is going to make it really easy. Uh, perhaps he's best known as being uh, CEO, President, and Chairman of Procter & Gamble. That was a, a mere 33-year stint in, in his career. But he, he, he also served as Secretary of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs last July. He became appointed as the April and J. Graham Fellow of the George W. Bush Institute, which is right around the corner from my house. And in September, he was appointed to the Biden trans, trans, uh, transition team as well. So quite a varied last decade of your life uh, that takes us back to what I'd like to start with. And that is what your roots are and what eventually landed you at, uh, at West Point where mm. you graduated in the top 2% of your class, which is in and of itself amazing. But why the interest in the military? How did you end up taking that route? Were, were there family members that, who served? Mm. Thank you, Daniel. It's great to be with you. Uh, my father served uh, in the occupation forces of Japan. He did his normal um, stint as most men did in those days. Um, so it really wasn't a, a, a family um, uh, history of, of military service, but um, my family uh, gave me, I think, a tremendous set of values. And, and one of that values was serving others. And my purpose in life is to improve the life of others. So uh, when I was young, uh, I wanted to go to West Point. I first applied when I was 11 years old. I was in sixth grade. Um, fortunately, my <laughs> congressman at the time, who uh, I thank profusely for this, encouraged me to continue applying every year. Uh, and then, of course, my junior year in high school, I became actually eligible. And, uh, and he took my best test scores from that period of time, from sixth grade to 11th grade. And uh, that congressman was Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, and every time I see Secretary Rumsfeld, I thank him for encouraging a young person over all those many years, knowing that they were, they were not immediately eligible. Um, Don Rumsfeld went to the White House to work for President Ford uh, before I was uh, actually appointed, and I or nominated rather, and I was nominated by uh, Phil Crane, who followed Don Rumsfeld. But yeah, I always wanted to do that because I, I wanted to live a different kind of life and I wanted to have an impact. Um, and that was marching to a different drummer in the 1960s and 70s. It was marching to a different drummer in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, you were you were definitely culturally speaking, at least, going in a much different direction. Uh, that that actually reminds me of a gentleman by the name of George Steinbrenner, and I, I bring that up because uh, after the Vietnam War had ended, uh, he he provided funding to Culver Military Academy so that they could start to bring in females, female cadets. Uh, my two uh, my, my my stepfather, my husband, now my two oldest, they're at Culver uh, Military Academy today. I spend quite a bit of time in Indiana. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful that there's a flight into South Bend. I'm happy that, <laughs> that Notre Dame exists because that makes life much easier getting to the middle of nowhere in Indiana. Um, my, my uncle went to Culver. It's a great school. Great oh, fantastic. School. Um, you, 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 my boys were very reticent. They thought that you know their friends still think that they've been punished. Uh, and yet now the boys have a true reverence uh, for the school. And I, I'm, I'm curious, how critical is it for our society to have an appreciation for the role that the military plays, for the role that discipline can play in mm -hmm. young people's lives? Well, I believe, I believe in service. As I said, my, my purpose in life is to improve the lives of others. And uh, throughout my my career, whether it's at the Procter and Gamble company, where on any given day five billion people on the planet use at least one Procter and Gamble product, and the purpose of the company is to improve the lives of the world's consumers, to my my job in the army and then my job as Secretary of the VA, it was all about improving the lives of others. So I I think that's very I think that's very important, and in fact I favor some sort. Of, um, of, of national service initiative. It doesn't necessarily need to be in the military, but I think um, when you have served others and when you've served your country, 
uh, and you have skin in the game, it's a great it's a great equalizer amongst people. I, 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 I can remember reading a book called The West Point Way of Leadership, and it talks about the fact that before you can learn to lead, you need to learn to follow. And one of the great equalizers in the military is when all the men or all the women get in the shower at the same time and you're all undressed, you have no rank. And uh, it's a great equalizer. You learn about people who aren't like you, yet are critical to the fabric of this country. That is, um, boy, that, that's just, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. Uh, and, and when you look at other countries, such as Israel, uh, to take but one example where service is indeed required, uh, you do see that culturally speaking, that it certainly has, uh, has quite the impact. Um, yeah, if you look at if you look at the results of research, like uh, there's a uh, was an organization called Got Your Six. They did research. Basically, the veterans of this country are those that are on the school board, are those that vote, are those that are engaged, are those that pick up litter along the side of the roads. The veterans of the country continue serving when they're done serving in uniform, and I don't think that's perhaps inborn, I think that might be because they've served the country and they realize the power of this communal force of working together toward a common good. So um, I'm gonna go way back before either of our times um, and we'll eventually lead into to, to your time at the VA. When World War I veterans came home uh, af after serving overseas, they were given $50 and a, and a, and a train ticket and that was it. And for years that followed, the government was, was criticized, especially as the country uh, fell into the, the Great Depression. Uh, so for years that followed, the government was criticized and they said, you know, we're not gonna let this happen again. And so when the soldiers came back and it was a very tight vote in fact, but when the soldiers were returning from World War II and, and boys went rushed to join the, the army when, when, when war broke out. But when they came back, came back from World War II, there was the GI Bill. And the, 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 the participation in, in the college program that was provided was enormous, as well as that which helped uh, veterans get into their first home uh, for the first time. There was also a provision in the GI Bill that provided for unemployment. And the funny thing is only 20% of those funds were ever tapped. Mm -hmm. uh, you got a much different sort of of perspective, if you will, seeing the contrast of how World War I veterans were treated versus those who came back from World War II. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And um, in my opinion, the Department of Veterans Affairs is a tremendous, uh, has a tremendous rate of return for the money invested by the American public. In 1946, as you mentioned, uh, President Truman went to General Omar Bradley, who was still on active duty, and said, we'd like you to investigate this thing and, and create this thing called uh, the Veterans Administration at the time. And, uh, and that was when uh, General Eisenhower became the chief of staff. And, um, and Bradley did it. And he came up with a brilliant, absolutely brilliant system that we benefit from today. He created affiliations with over 1,800 medical schools around the country. And he built VA hospitals next to medical schools. So it's not an accident that if you go to Duke University, the VA hospital is right next to Duke Medical School, Stanford, uh, Chicago Rush, uh, Emory in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, the VA hospitals are right next to medical schools. And then the, the professors who teach and do research in the medical school also work in the VA. So what does this do? Well, Number one, most of the major medical innovations in this country have come from VA doctors, the first liver transplant, first implantable cardiac pacemaker. There in Texas, you have the Michael DeBakey uh, heart uh, clinic, um, uh, aspirin a day to ward off heart disease, shingles vaccine, uh, sensors in the brain to, to move prosthetic limbs. All of these things uh, came from doctors working at the VA and working at medical universities. Second point is 70% of the doctors in this country are trained by the VA. What do I mean? Well, as they go through medical school, they then do their residency funded by uh, 
CMS, the government, uh, in the VA. So most of them have their residencies in the VA and they remember those times uh, very well. And then the third point, which is the most important for veterans, is the veterans get the best care from these doctors who are teaching medicine every single day, you know? And so who would you rather have care for you, but somebody who's actually having to teach it, if you believe in Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, when he talks about the best way to learn something is to teach it. So it's a brilliant system and, uh, and it works extremely well today for veterans, but also for the American public. You, you remind me, I, I, I lived in New York on 9-11, and um, I, I, I was reminded that, that, that there were certain victims who were sent to San Antonio, burn victims, because that is, that Brook Army is to this day the best burn center in, yeah. in the country. Great uh, polytrauma center. Absolutely. And well, uh, that's another point, Daniel, that you make that I should have raised, which is the VA is the medical safety net of the country. So uh, when, when the Ebola crisis uh, came up in West Africa, mm -hmm. uh, we were ready with negatively pressurized rooms to accept Ebola patients coming from abroad and to treat them. So think of us, think of the VA as the, as the safety net uh, for medicine in this country. Remarkable. Um, so you, something always struck me. I, I always heard that on any given medicine in America, if, if the medicine is being purchased through the Veterans Administration, it's going to have a much better price tag than if it's going through Medicaid or Medicare. And you did some extraordinary streamlining and you, you created massive efficiencies uh, in the supply chain when you were there. Can you walk me through uh, how you generated uh, it, the savings that you did uh, when, when you were there? Well, I, I benefited from my experience at the Procter & Gamble Company creating global supply chains um, around the world. I mean, at Procter & Gamble, for example, we would have, you know, when we started this, we'd have maybe 200 different specifications for water and, and 200 different people buying water where water is the same commodity no matter where you buy it. Um, so we had the same thing at the VA. What we had at the VA was... Um, Every medical center, and we have, you know, 2,000 different points of care, 150 medical centers, uh, every one had their own supply chain. Every one did their own purchasing. And as a result of that, we lost scale, dramatically lost scale. We created inefficiencies. And if you think about it, you had 150 pox pockets of inventory, which could then get depleted and needed help from somewhere else. So um, what we did was very simple is we, we aggregated specifications, we tried to develop singular supply chains, and really our, our, our beacon for that was something the VA had done years before, which was create the very best pharmacy uh, that, that distributes drugs in the country. The VA has a consolidated pharmacy that ships drugs to patients, and through that consolidation, we're able to get much better prices and also much better responsiveness. For example, it's not just about price, but by having that kind of scale, you can ask the drug manufacturer to please package the drug in a certain way that better meets the needs of veterans. Like if they have trouble pushing the pill out of a, a, a blister pack, you can ask them to you know, do it in a different way to, to benefit the veterans. So scale has a lot of advantages and consolidation of supply chains really helps that. It's remarkable to hear you say this because in a post-pandemic world, we get so much delivered to our homes and everything is, is viewed through that prism of how can we get it the, the most efficiently and easily. And, and, and you were already there. You were already way over there. <laughs> Well, I'm also a culprit, though, too. I mean, I may have a book delivered one day and, a, and a groceries delivered the next to my home, and that's, that's inherently inefficient because we're paying for each one of those trips. That's true. That's true. Um, so I, I, but before I, I move on to Procter & Gamble and corporations and how things are being run, um, can, can you talk a little bit about what is lacking for our veterans, what we can do better for our veterans, how we can uh, better attract more young men and women to, to serve. 
Boy, your last point is spot on. Uh, we need to attract more. Um, 70%, roughly 70% of eligible children of the age to join the military are currently ineligible, largely because of their lack of physical fitness and also uh, primarily obesity. So we have a significant issue. Now, this is the 50th anniversary of the all, well, will soon be the 50th anniversary of the All Volunteer Army, which started in 1973. And one of the things I worry about is when an army or a military gets disassociated from its society, that you run into problems. I, I remember, I often tell people that when Washington crossed the Delaware on that fateful Christmas Eve, and he defeated the British forces, they weren't actually British, they were Hessians, they were German mercenaries that the British had hired to fight an unpopular war in, in the British uh, kingdom. So um, we can't have mercenaries fighting our wars and the military is becoming a family business. You know, roughly 35, 38% have a parent in the military, uh, about 50% have at least a grandparent or, you know, a parent or grandparent. So we really need to get a military that, that represents our country. And this is one of the things that, that those of us are worried about. So um, we need to broaden and create a diverse group of people uh, willing to serve. Um, and, and I think that um, all of us can play a role in that uh, by, by talking up the opportunity. I mean, obviously, going to West Point changed the trajectory of my life. Serving in the Army changed the trajectory of my life. So I think it's a very positive thing. I've, I've met a lot of people who've gone in the military and come out in a very positive way. I very seldom meet anyone, if anyone, that goes in the military and comes out um, uh, worse off. So I think we've got to start considering uh, some kind of, of national service. It doesn't necessarily need to be military, but some kind of commitment um, to this country that we live in. So uh, talk about your, your time. Uh, you were airborne, if I if I recall correctly. Yeah, I was. I graduated, as, as you said, toward the top of my class at, in, uh, at West Point. So it gave me the opportunity to choose my branch of service and my first assignment. And um, rather than typically the people on top of the class go into the Corps of Engineers, um, Douglas MacArthur was, a, was an engineer before he commanded uh, troops as an infantry officer. Um, so I went in the infantry. I was the second person in my class to go in the infantry. Uh, I went to airborne school in 1973. I went to ranger school in 1975. Of all the things I've accomplished in life, I think graduation from ranger school the first time is uh, high on my list. Only about 27% or so of people graduate uh, the first time. Uh, and then I went to the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, arguably, uh, well, not arguably, at the time it was the Army's Rapid Deployment Force. And I served in the 1st of the 504th Airborne Infantry. During that time, we were in peace, but we deployed in order to train. Sometimes when you deployed, you, didn't, you weren't sure it was going to be training, but we went to Arctic Warfare School in Alaska. We went to Desert Warfare School in Death Valley, California. We went to Jungle Warfare School in Panama. And um, all of those um, uh, deployments uh, strengthened our unit and, uh, and I thought uh, made us more ready. We jumped in all those places, obviously, and then were picked up and jumped back out uh, three, four months later. Wow. I just, I'm trying to imagine that. And, and that would certainly instill uh, discipline. Um, talk, uh, talk a little bit about what you're doing with the Bush Institute. Because I, I, I see 9-11, I, I don't know that I, I, I understand how to connect those dots. Right. Well, as you know, President Bush is deeply committed to veterans. Um, he feels a deep visceral responsibility, just as President Obama, because I've had this discussion with President Obama, just as President Obama felt, when you send someone in the battle uh, at the risk of life, limb, whatever, you, 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 know, you, you feel that very viscerally. And as a result, he set up this military service initiative led by Colonel Matt Amidon, and we work to try to improve the lives of veterans. We do that through helping the leaders of the veteran service organizations improve their leadership of those organizations. Mm -hmm. We do that through connecting people 
uh, who need mental health care. Uh, but most recently, I, I, I worked on an, an op-ed uh, to support the launch of President Bush's book, um, Out of Many, One, uh, E Pluribus Unum, which is his book of portraits of immigrants who have come to this country. And in my op-ed, I particularly focused on uh, Captain Flo Groberg. Uh, I was in the East Room of the White House when President Obama presented him the Medal of Honor for his heroism uh, in Afghanistan. Grievous wounds, but, but uh, survived. And, um, and President Bush painted his portrait. And generally, the portrait's in, in black and white and grayscale. But then he painted the Medal of Honor in color. And it's a, it's a striking portrait. But what most Americans didn't know, and President Bush points out, is that um, Flo was a, an immigrant. He, he was an immigrant from France, and he joined the military. And many people who joined the military see joining the military as a way to citizenship. And um, uh, that's a very important way for the military to get volunteers. Uh, for the military to assimilate immigrants uh, into our country and for our immigrants to have the opportunity to serve. Most people don't know this, but you know, when the Civil War was fought, uh, roughly 40% of the Union forces were immigrants. And when, and when the war ended, that was the beginning of the VA. Uh, President Lincoln said in his second inaugural address, we've got to care for those who have borne the battle, their widows and their children. And one of his first sites was in Maine, and he bought a resort that had gone bankrupt. And the veterans would go there to recuperate from their wounds or from the war, and they would train them vo vocationally because these were immigrants who had no families uh, in the United States, and they needed that kind of support. And that was really the beginning of the Veterans uh, Administration at that time, or the Department of Veterans Affairs today. So you, you mentioned the word vocational. Uh, I, I, I put the, the two together because so many of the younger people who, my generation, they would go through shop. You would hear about them flowing into the military. Uh, how do we revive vocational training in this country? I mean, the average, yeah. the average electrician is in his 50s, uh, and he can cer certainly charge rates as if he's in his 50s as well. Uh, but it seems like we're out of balance in the United States in terms of tradespeople versus people with four-year educations. Totally, totally out of balance. I, 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 um, I'm a huge believer in community colleges and the role they play in vocational training. When, when we were um, in the process of building a new plant at the Procter & Gamble Company, we would always try to locate it near a community college because we knew that we couldn't take uh, students directly from high school or directly from college into the plant to be the technicians. In, in 1980, when I joined the company, technicians would walk the factory floor with, with screwdrivers and wrenches and hammers. You know, when I retired in 2013, you need to work an iPad. And, and so we'd always set up a relationship with the community college where they could help train the, tech, the, the people to become technicians in our plant. Um, and, and that helped us uh, tremendously. So I'm, I'm a huge, huge believer in, in technical training and, and think it's a, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity. I, when I was in, uh, when I was Secretary of the VA, we helped set up a program with uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel and, and the leaders of Chicago, where any veteran coming back from military service could get an automatic uh, free entry to the community college to learn how to work on devices that um, were owned by the gas company. And, and, and the union supported that because they immediately became a, a union member. And my thought was very simple as I visited in Chicago, which is, who would you rather have working on your gas lines than somebody who'd worked on a nuclear reactor and a nuclear submarine and made sure that that was safe. You know, someone in the military who had learned attention to detail. So uh, totally support your point of view, big believer in community colleges and vocational training. Yeah, I, well, I had no choice, but I am a product of the community college system as well. I, I've gone on to get four degrees, but I started out in the community college 
uh, system. And I, I think it needs to be uh, strengthened and it needs to be a way for children who are undereducated, even though they graduate from public high schools, to continue on and figure out those next two years if they're going to head into college or if they're better suited uh, to go the technical to go, to go the technical route. You're so right. If I can make one other comment, um, sure, please. It it always drove me crazy the number of veterans who would leave the military and not take advantage of their GI Bill, and and sometimes that step to a four-year degree college is too big for someone who's the f- first member of their family going to that degree, you know, going into college. And that vocational school, that community college is a great, great first step. And, and as you say, four degrees later, here you are. Um, so I, I really do think it's, it's an important thing for our society. And, and you know, uh, Germany does a great job of this, by yes, the way. Yes, they do. Germany does a really good job of parsing out where the personality and where the skill set, how that needs to be deployed throughout the economy. And they work with, you know, the German, German companies work with the German government to reskill existing workers, knowing that there's a new technology coming down the pipeline that's going to make these workers redundant. Yes. And, you know, here we have 17 million Americans who are out of work, many of whom will never pour back into the brick and mortar retail pool to take but one example, because the brick and mortar footprint isn't what, what it used to be. Right. And, and of course, Germany is renowned for its engineering. Um, we make, uh, we, I always say we, cause I still feel part of the Procter and Gamble company, uh, Gillette razor blades, the, the five bladed fusion razor blades are made there and I use them. Uh, <laughs> talk about a precision technology. Uh, it's a precision technology made by people who know how to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, I, again, I've, I've been saying for a very long time that that we need to consult more closely with the country of Germany to help our youth and kind of the sclerosis in the job market, you know, push forward. Um, let's uh, one last thing, um, and and this is not the happiest subject, but why have we seen so much suicide among our veterans? Well, first of all, if you if you step way back from it, um, I always said that the VA, the Department of Veterans Affairs, is the canary in the coal mine for American medicine. If Senator John Tester said to me, why don't you have an orthopedic surgeon in northwest Montana? Chances are there wasn't a civilian orthopedic surgeon in northwest Montana. So the the, the problems for the VA, because it's the largest medical system in the country, are also the problems for American medicine. Um, we have a mental health problem in this country. Uh, you know, 35% or so of people suffer from depression, 56% or so of people go undiagnosed. Um, if I go to a medical school to recruit people for the VA, which I did, I went to most of the medical schools in the country to recruit. Um, you'll find very few people going into mental health care. And uh, when I went to Harvard to recruit uh, there, the CEO of Massachusetts General Hospital said to me, you know, for every mental health patient that walks through the door, I lose $100. Um, It's hard. We're we're just now beginning to be able to diagnose the wounds you don't see. Uh, One of the things we'd say at the VA or in the military is, you know, you have wounds that you see, you have wounds you don't see. The wounds you see, we know how to fix broken legs. We know how to fix broken arms. Uh, The wounds you don't see, post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, something called CTE, which is uh, um, the damage created through collision. Uh, uh, And and many football players, boxers suffer from this. Dr. Ann McKee, a VA doctor at Bosch University is the world's expert on this. Um, we've got to get better. And, and the only way we can get better is if we call, all come together around it. When I was a secretary of the VA, I knew I didn't have much authority, but I had some convening authority. So I got everybody together for a conference. We called it Brain Trust. And we tried to understand what are the recent innovations um, in brain technology and, and what can we do to p- accelerate them, to push them along? And CTE, for example, the only way you can discover is if someone has CTE is to basically dissect their brain after they die. So I've, I've donated my brain to science 
But but the problem is we need scanning technology that's acute enough to be able to diagnose that brain injury and and then create neuroplasticity, create alternate ways for that brain to communicate uh, to avoid that section that may have been damaged. It's it's a big issue. It's a it's a really big issue. Um, a lot of us are working on it. I'm still working on it through a company called Rally Point. Mm -hmm. I'm the chairman of the board of I've invested in, um, but it's, it, it's going to be with us, uh, until we can marshal enough resources to really get after this. I keep saying we need to send more people to the moon because one of the, one of the most dynamic times when children wanted to go into, into, into STEM education was, was that era when we were, when everybody was so fascinated with what the next generation was going to be because they could watch it on TV and it was very tangible and real. So I'm, I'm still, I'm, it's my biggest advocate these days. It's like, let's, let's keep sending people to the moon and get these kids excited. Absolutely. I mean, we saw tremendous progress when we worked together on cancer, when uh, at the time vice president Biden was leading the cancer moonshot that president Obama challenged him with. And of course, having lost his son made it very poignant to him. We made a lot of progress in a short period of time. And um, I think we can do the same with mental health care, but it's, it's, it's very challenging and it's very difficult. And there's a stigma in this country. You know, I went, I was in Texas there, uh, although I was in San Antonio and I went with uh, Beto O'Rourke, who's the Congressman there at the time. And we went to visit um, the new uh, uh, University of Texas San Antonio Medical School, and they had created this building, which in neon signs said, you know, like mental health uh, clinic. And being a Procter and Gamble guy, being a guy who's observed consumers all over the world, I sat with Beto in the parking lot, and I said, "Let's watch this, and we'll see nobody walk into that building from the parking lot." And and sure enough, what would happen was people would park next door at the hospital, the, the tower the hospital, walk across the parking lot because they didn't want to be seen in a car in the parking lot. We've got to get out of that. We've got to get out of the stigma. And um, I'm hoping through more people telling their stories, through more veterans telling their stories, that mm -hmm. uh, we'll be able to eliminate the stigma. Um, so... It's it, it says something about somebody's career. I'm going to shift gears here when there's a Harvard case study attached to them. Um, I, I remember one of the first Harvard case studies I read was about Roger Enrico, who was at PepsiCo. And his, his idea of how to achieve success was to create a crisis inside of the corporation if, if there was complacency. Uh, Larry Bossidy, uh, I actually got to know Roger late in his life. I know his son, Aaron. I, I've met Larry Bossidy as well. His key word is execution. Yes. Uh, you're all Great about talk. strategy. Your, your, your key word is strategy. Well, no, I actually, I would tell you that my key, well, it's strategy to execution, because obviously if you don't execute, uh, it doesn't matter what your strategy is. When we created a um, a leadership model at the Procter & Gamble company. We did this, um, gosh, in the, uh, I guess it was in the, about, about the turn of the century, uh, or well, 1999, 2000, uh, five E's. Uh, envision, create the vision, engage, engage people in that vision, energize, get them energized, motivated, enable, create the organization capability for it. And then last, but most importantly is execute because you know, that's the fifth E. If, if you don't execute, nothing else matters. So uh, I'm, I'm totally with Larry. I loved his book. Um, uh, I've, I've been with him a few times. And uh, so I agree with you. It's execution. So, uh, you know, it, it seems to me being a consumer, a mother of four, I've, I've certainly been consuming Procter & Gamble products since they were in diapers. Uh, and on through. You're very welcome. Uh, but I have seen a shift over the past 20 years or so of trying to branch out the product lineup to where there's kind of this high tier, full price point, and then ones that were a little bit off price point. So um, how has that worked out? Well, the, the Procter & Gamble company uh, really believes in having a portfolio of products in any category to meet whatever your need is. Uh, you know, if, if you think your 
hair is uh, damaged and you need healthy hair, we have Pantene with its provitamin. But if you're if you like to smell a little bit more like a man and um, and you're not as uh, hair engaged, let's say we have Old Spice. And, uh, you know, so when I joined the company, as I recall, in 1980, this is a long time ago. I mean, I think we had 11 different laundry detergents. Uh, that was too many. We uh-huh. ended up culling that down, you know, to three or four now. But, um, but you know, there were different needs and, and people wanted their needs met. And some people like a lot more fragrance, some don't. Some have uh, particulate soil and grass stains, some don't. So we want to make sure we, we meet the, uh, the consumer's need. The consumer's the judge. The consumer's the boss, not not the company. Oh, clearly. Uh, but but how um, I mean, how much of a challenge is it to keep innovation alive inside of a massive company like that? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, if the purpose of the Procter and Gamble company is to improve the lives of the world's consumers, the way we do that is through innovation. So we spend Procter and Gamble spends over two billion dollars a year on on innovation. Uh, and the same is true of the VA. You know, I, I, I brought that same thinking uh, to the VA where we had to innovate uh, to continue to find ways to improve the lives of veterans, whether it was a new scheduling system to make it easier for them to get in, whether it was a, uh, a new um, uh, uh, electronic medical record uh, to keep track of them, whether it was teaching private sector doctors how to about the military culture innovation was our lifeblood. And what I was disappointed at the VA at the time was we didn't have a culture of innovation. We had a culture of, uh, I invent it. And then if it's not invented here, I don't own it. Well, I'd seen that at Procter and Gamble, but we set up an innovation task force within the VA that was charged with finding, uh, those innovations that were working and then transferring them across the entire system to raise all boats. Yeah, I mean, I when when I when I read that 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 you you get your appointment within thirty days of making it, I said, wait a minute, that's not that's not the reputation that the VA used to have, uh, but that's incredible, and it, it makes a huge difference in their lives. Uh, well, we had we had a, a goal that by the end of two thousand sixteen, we we achieved it, but by the end of two thousand sixteen, any veteran could get same day help for mental health care or primary care at any VA medical center. And we achieved that uh, at the time. So in your career, you watched a true revolution in inventory management. Uh, You witnessed the evolution of just-in-time inventory and beginning with with the trade war through where we are today. We have a global pandemic in the middle of it. I, I think a lot of companies right now are rethinking the globality of the supply chain and and whether or not just in time is the way to run a company going forward. What what are your thoughts? That's a good question. You know, my my first general manager assignment at Procter and Gamble, this is in 1991, was general manager of the Philippines, uh, 7,000 islands. And we had, we had hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of warehouses. And um, the problem was I always had the wrong inventory in the wrong place at the wrong time. So what we tried to do was to create a uh, supply chain that was just in time enough that we could close some of those warehouses and, and, and create a more linear uh, uh, supply chain where we had pockets of inventory, but we had pockets of inventory in accessible places. It's hard to get from one distant island uh, to the next. I think, I think now the issue on, on supply chain management is um, you can't treat every product or every ingredient the same. You've got to figure out uh, what's the frequency of use. And for example, if, if it's uh, water and it's frequently used, maybe you can use a linear supply chain without inventory but if it's something where um, it's it's less frequently used, or there's some kind of shelf life uh, criteria, you might want to try something else. So it really gets down to creating the supply chain for each ingredient or grouping ingredients uh, to create a supply chain for that ingredient 
where they come together at the end. But, you know, we uh, I remember in the 1980s, we all learned from the Japanese. It was the Toyota Kanban system, it was called uh, just in time management. Anybody on the manufacturing line could pull a cord and stop the manufacturing line. Um, but as in all things, we tend to oscillate. We tend to go too far one way, learn and then come back. And I really do think it's going to be getting into the detail of each and every product or ingredient in the supply chain to design um, the right, the right flow. So I, I think uh, as we emerge from this pandemic, we've learned a lesson about not having all of a critical resource produced overseas. So if you were charged with tomorrow with revitalizing the medical supply manufacturing sector in, 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 in the United States, where would we, how could we even begin? Is it feasible for us to rebuild an industry that we now know the hard way is essential. Well, I think I think first of all, this is one of the reasons where, um, in my opinion, politicians need to understand the interdependence of our world. Right, um, Procter and Gamble's earnings when I was CEO were were bigger than the G GDP of forty percent of the countries in the world, and so you know you've got to realize that we're in this interdependent world and that, and that, and that you bring people together against common purpose, common issues, and, and therefore your supply chain doesn't get disrupted. I mean, it, you know, if, if we have, um, I don't know how many we have now, but we have thousands of employees in China, we have thousands of employees in Russia, um, do they see the United States as the enemy? I don't think so. If you wanted to talk to them, if you wanted to talk to our Chinese employees, for example, about being members of the Communist Party, I'm not even sure they would know what that meant. I mean, I've talked to many of our Chinese employees uh, during my time um, who who were were less less focused on that. They they're focused on their family, their job. So I just think that that we've got to think interdependently. Um, not that we shouldn't also think what would happen if if something bad happened and we have to protect that item. Um, but I think, again, it all starts with the ingredient and, and the ingredient or the product. And you've got to decide um, how important that ingredient or product is and therefore where to source it. It's not unusual for the Procter & Gamble company to work on developing sources for raw materials from companies that don't already do business with us. Um, one of my, so I'm a nine-year veteran of the Federal Reserve System, and uh, one of my greatest pet peeves is kind of the the ebb, the, the the shrinking of capital expenditures, and this mammoth increase. We've just seen the two largest months on record of share buybacks. Right. How do we how, how do we incentivize those who occupy the C-suite? to put their focus back on organically growing their companies? Good question, but I, I, um, I'm not sure the Procter & Gamble company ever suffered from that, but so I may be the wrong person to talk to, but- Well, that's precisely the point. <laughs> but I think that, I, well, no, I think you're right. I mean, to me, the equation is very simple. The algorithm is very simple. You wanna improve consumers' lives, You've got to do that through innovative products and services. You have to invest in innovation. And then in investing in innovation, you've got to invest in the factories and laboratories that lead to that innovation. I, I give you a great example. We, when um, I think I was CEO at the time, maybe I was running our laundry and cleaning business. We discovered that um, we made an ingredient called a surfactant. Um, uh, BASF, a chemical company in Germany, made a different ingredient that made that even more effective. And, and we worked together and, and recognizing that most organizational problems occur at the boundaries of organizations, what we did was we set up a, a co-laboratory facility in Ludwigshaven where BASF is located. We sent our surfactant scientists to live in Germany in the same uh, room, you know, they worked in the same room with the BASF scientists, 
And the innovation that came out of there was remarkable because you eliminated that boundary. So how do we do that? I mean, how do we realize that we're in an interdependent world and try to work as much as we can to reduce boundaries, work against common purposes, and, and, get, and really get some things done? The biggest problems in the world, the naughtiest problems in the world, are, are all problems that uh, one country or one person can't solve. My, my wife and I endowed a, um, a leadership conference at West Point that we call the Conference for Leaders of Character. We pay for, we endowed it, so we pay for 80 students to come from around the world. They have to be chosen by their university president. And then the leadership department at, at West Point, along with uh, some mentors, we call them senior fellows that we invite, help mentor these young people and, and then they go back out to their home countries or their home universities. And the whole idea here is, I know we can't do it alone. I know one person can't, I know one country can't, but can we create cohorts that sustain themselves over time and can come together again against some of these really big problems? So um, another issue I think that companies are facing now that they haven't faced in a generation uh, is wage pressures. Mm. And uh, but but some would argue that that there there's been a long desert of time where the balance between what you pay your workers and what the executives are paid, that that, that gulf is too wide and it needs to to to, to close. And you know, the outgrowth has, of course, been income inequality in this country, which is as bad as it's been since um, since basically the, the years leading up to the to the Great Depression. Yeah. So, I know it's a thorny issue, um, but I'm curious. I'm curious how you think companies can work with the government, public-private partnerships, uh, to, to try and, and and raise the bar for everybody. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm on the board of advisors of a company of a organization, a nonprofit called Just Capital, that rates companies on things like this. The the uh, 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 the income disparity from the lowest level to the CEO, um, how they treat the environment and so forth. And I would encourage you, I encourage everybody listening to look at Just Capital's rating of companies. Um, at the Procter & Gamble company, it's a little bit different. Uh, we were the first company, I think, in the country uh, to make sure that everybody owned uh, company stock. Um, back in, in the 1800s, 1900s, we had something called dividend days where employees would get together. There weren't many at the time. And, uh, and they would have a picnic and, and, and they were awarded company stock in their, in their profit sharing trust program. Uh, and over time, that became the primary source of their family wealth, not their, not their monetary compensation each month. And, and so uh, one of the values of the Procter & Gamble company, we've talked about the purpose to improve lives. One of the values is ownership uh, and leadership. And so we expect every employee to lead and we expect the values of the company and the individual are inseparable because we're all owners of the company. So um, I, that to me is a, a really big idea for companies who don't do that um, mm -hmm. because it, it makes your job so much so much easier as a leader uh, to have that inseparability of, um, of interests. Um, I was searching for a similar thing at the VA, obviously at the VA, at any government, you don't give out stock options, but, but um, in, the, in the middle of, of what it is for government employees is, is the greater good, is the public good. And, and the motivation people have, the purpose they have for working for the federal government. And taking advantage of that was a, was a big plus. Yeah, my mother's a 37-year veteran of uh, the Social Security Administration, so. Um, God bless her, thank you. We, we need that. You know, um, over half, I think, of federal employees, I'm on the board of something called the Partnership for Public Service that works for uh, enhancing uh, federal employment. Um, Fifty percent are retirement eligible. Uh, Six percent are under the age of thirty. So we have a real problem. Oh wow! I had never heard those statistics. Never. And we have fewer government, federal government employees today as a percent of GDP 
than we did years ago. People have the impression that the number is higher, but relative to the size of our economy, it's actually lower. So um, two, two last subjects. Um, you, you know, I, you, you, think of, you think of the fall of Rome and I study relationship, the relationship with China quite a bit. And more than, more than just the one country, any, any student of history knows that alliances are built over time. And if there's one thing that the, the pandemic has, has revealed, if you will, it is the sheer number of countries that are deeply indebted uh, to China. Uh, Germany does more business with China than they do with the United States. That's a fairly recent phenomena, but China has indeed invested quite a bit in, directly into Europe as well. And, and of course, when you consider copper, soybeans, you know, a lot of the South American corridor is also economically beholden uh, to China, if you will. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious what your, your thoughts are on the projections that they're going to be the biggest economy in the world within just a few years here. Well, I think, I think that I, as the former chairman of the U.S.-China Business Council, I, 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 I do think that's inevitable just based on demographics. Uh, their, their GDP will be larger than ours. Uh, now, President Xi would tell you, and, and he said this in my presence, President Hu would tell you that if you measure per capita uh, GDP, you get a much, much different story. Uh, having traveled to China uh, for years, uh, we first entered China in, in August 8th, 1988. Uh, for those of you who are Chinese experts, you know eight is a lucky number. Um, and uh, we're... we're the Procter and Gamble Company is critical to the economy of China. I mean, you know, the, the shampoo, the soap, the detergent, uh, the diapers, um, critical. So, I I really think that uh, the approach to take is one that's a, a measured approach. I, I a measured approach where there's both uh, incentive and reward for cooperation, as well as uh, punishment, if you want to call it that, sanction. Uh, for lack of lack of cooperation, but I don't, I don't, I personally don't see Danielle, and you may disagree with me, and that's fine. I personally don't see how you disentangle this world. I, I mean, I, I, uh, my kids, my kids, uh, kid me. They say, Dad, you know, you were so lucky. You grew up during the time of globalization, and of course, our family has benefited from that. We've lived abroad quite a bit. Um, having seen this entanglement occur. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, people being better off, I mean, how many, what, half a billion people uh, rose out of poverty in China? Um, it's people remarkable. sure enjoy shopping at Walmart and getting goods that may be made in a low-cost manufacturing environment. Mm -hmm. um, how do you cause people to forget their self-interest? Oh, I'm not going to buy that, that good in Walmart because it's made in China, even though it costs less. Or, I, you know... Uh, I don't. I just don't see that happening. I don't see the disentanglement of countries. So I think the challenge for us is to create strong, very strong multilateral alliances. Like, for example, I was a fan of the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, mm -hmm. which which was designed, frankly, to yes. be a bulwark against China, um, and at the same time have great. Um, uh, bilateral relations. Uh, I don't think there's a substitute. I, I really don't see us. I don't think you can build a wall around your country in the year 2021. It just doesn't, doesn't work. Oh, I don't, I don't think we can, I don't think we can undo globalization. And I, I think that that's, it, it, it's, it's inherently complete. It's just not feasible. Um, nor would it benefit anybody in the world. For, I mean, if you think about the, the next countries that will benefit from this. Right. At some point, hopefully, we don't have to have such huge distinctions between emerging markets and, and frontier markets and developed markets. Uh, but just it, it's the 400 years of history part where reserve currency status uh, has never been lost if, if there wasn't a war in between. It's, it's that part of the equation, because if you are the world's largest economy, you do tend to have the reserve currency. And that that is something that that 
that I think about, and it's why my oh, I, I think that's a, <laughs> that's a that's a great thought. That's a great thought. But I think I think there are more criteria. And I think you would agree with me. There are more criteria to being chosen as a reserve currency than simply being the world's largest economy. Oh yes, the transparency of our economy, the ability to trade in our economy, and so forth. And I think it's going to be a long time, very long time, arguably maybe never, that the Chinese economy gets there, right? Because can you have a open market-oriented economic system without a free political system? That, that's, that's the ultimate answer. Now, when I asked that question, for example, of uh, Madame Ma, who was the vice minister of, of the economy, she, she would say to me, well, we're, we're not that different. The difference is you all, you Americans, you all disagree publicly, and then you make a decision, you vote publicly, you make a decision. We in China, we all disagree within the party privately. And then when we make a decision, we go out and execute well because we're already aligned. I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know. But um, uh, I think you raise an interesting question, really interesting question. So um, ending on a positive note, uh, what what about what do you see in our in our country? What do you see in the world that is the most encouraging emerging sign out there? It can be anything. Well, I <laughs> thank you for asking that. Um, I go back to a book written by Matt Ridley. Uh, as you and I have talked, I've been a student of innovation for a long time. Matt mm-hmm. Ridley is a great author. He wrote a book called Irrational Optimist, and he talked about how the British were absolutely concerned in the late 1800s that they would suffocate under a heap of horse manure because there were so many horses. <laughs> and of course, they didn't, they didn't expect the advent of the automobile. Um, so I'm, I'm, an, I'm an irrational optimist because I believe in innovation and I believe in our country and the culture and system we have that results arguably in the best innovation in the world. I can't tell you the number of times I've traveled to a different country, China included, and the people would say to me, tell me how to create a Silicon Valley in my country. And of course, I'd start with, well, it's not about the valley. It's not about the air. It's not, you know, and, and, and then you have to talk about the role of, of Stanford University, the role of venture capitalists, the role of, of all these different things, private equity. Um, and we just have a tremendous innovative system that we cannot lose because that innovative system is the engine uh, for our country. It's the engine for our companies. Why, you know, think about the number of globally competitive companies that are located in the United States. Why is that versus how many are in China, right? We just can't lose that. And, and I'm an optimist. I think we're going to continue to have that as long as we continue to nourish the institutions that have been so important in this country. Well, I, I love that. And um, and don't forget to tell people when you run into them, don't forget about the new space race. Uh, and I'll tell people about innovation. I'm for you. I live in Orlando, Florida, so I'm not far from Candy Center. <laughs> That's We were just there. We were just very there. Very exciting. Thank you so much for your time Thank today. Thank you, Danielle. It's, it's great so to be with you. so good getting to know you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. fun. Well, I'm not sure about you, but I, I certainly feel like I need to go stand underneath an American flag and, and salute my country and thank all of those who served. Uh, I hope you found uh, Bob McDonald to be just as inspiring as I did. Please take to heart some of the things we spoke about in, in terms of encouraging community college, encouraging innovative thinking, and encouraging the space race, encouraging STEM, uh, STEM studies. And, uh, and, and deliver them, carry, carry the message. If you're interested in another discussion I had a few months ago with Brigadier General Robert Spaulding, you can catch that episode as well. There's a link to it. And don't forget, if you haven't already, please subscribe. Thank you.